we are on Salt Spring Island, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Hokanam and Sincotan speaking peoples. I'm so grateful to have lived on this island for over 30 years. First, deep in the woods, and for the past 10 years, here on this hill, with a view to the southwest of Mount Maxwell and Mount Prevo on Vancouver Island in the far distance. You can't see it today. It's misty, but that will change. I'll start with my first book. It's called Decked and Dancing. Still life. Come to this life as in a dream, a sense of floating, as if your presence grows inside a room, a life with no appointments, no demands, no calls, nothing to be done. Come to solitude. Resonating silence. Time is nothing more than two hands on a clock. Two hands, many chambers, leading to other spaces in your mind where doors open. Come to stillness. Music in the highest branches of trees. Time embraces you with space for everything or nothing to be. Impermanence. Decaying old growth stumps, young fir and cedar. A voice calls, look up, look up. We sign our names on the mortgage. Two acres, wild honeysuckle, arbutus and bedrock. Our three-year-old daughter vanishes on rough pathways trampled by deer. First, an outhouse, the hole dug with a pick and buckets of sweat. Wedged among Douglas fir, you frame a 12-foot square on skids with rambling porches, one for motorcycles and engines. Wild ocean spray screens the outdoor shower. We glimpse tree trunks, legs of giants clambering around the cabin. An owl hoots at night. I hold you closest when you are gone, push you away when near. One summer you raise the roof, make headroom under the canopy. For 10 years we've been living on this property and I walk in the woods almost every day. Um, it's easy to climb up the hill and go. And right now with the rain everything is coming back to life after the drought. This one's called Illusion. In the fog Maidenhair moss hangs from an ancient oak. Water drips into your hair. You sense the expansive view across the ocean to another country, San Juan, Orcas, Mount Baker. But you see nothing inside this cloud. A plane drones, a boat murmurs, and a foghorn moans. Mist beads on your cheeks and eyes, close and intimate as a lover who evaporates and reappears, a mountain soaring above low clouds, strong and solid, to hold you close and true. In the spring here, we have hundreds of hummingbirds, um, and now we see the occasional annas, but when they're all at the feeder, it's, it's a frenzy. And it's uh, so much fun to watch them, but it's also sad when they hit the glass, so this is, Hummingbird, ethereal in my hand, an iridescent female, feathers fanned, beak wide open. I place her in the hollow arbutus stump, a stupa covered with wild rose petals. Did she expect a long life? More sugar water at the feeder, more buzzing and display? The glass tricked her as images beguile us into believing this life will go on and on. This body will endure in a certain way of being. Like the bird, enticed into flying fast, we dash full force towards something glimpsed, some truth longed for, just out of reach, on the far side, where nothing is clear or certain. In Zen practice, we talk about form and emptiness, uh, and we chant 
form is emptiness, emptiness form. And so I've sat with that question, like, what is it? What is emptiness? Is it boundless? So Rilke has told us to learn to love the questions themselves. So this one is, what is it? You are wind in the firs, lifting sleep from the wings of ravens. You are the fairy horn, booming through the fog bank. You are the murky mountains, hovering a blur of gray in the black sea. You are a kelp forest, waving underwater in the rolling current. You are tide pools, pulsing, barnacles, crabs, anemones. You are the song of the varied thrush, resonating in arbutus boughs. You are the smell of red berries fermenting, the birds gorging. You are the drunken junco flying full force into the glass. You are the green mountains of moss migrating over rocks. You are forest rain dripping from cedar boughs. And the bird, one wing askew, limping down the path. The poem, not yet formed, silent, not knowing. Rain, raindrops in a puddle, three concentric rings merging into a ripple. A frenzy of drops, spilling as if someone said, play. So we live here at the end of the road. There's not many people around, and the wildlife like it here because we have a pond. Normally we have a couple of bucks hanging about. This is more about a cougar that we occasionally have had around in the neighborhood. This one's called Wild. He spotted a cougar at the compost heap. On the trail in the forest below the house, he found dung, the telling blunt-ended shape. He is certain. They lurk and hide in trees, ready to pounce. A young woman was slain as she skied on a marked track in Banff. She didn't know what jumped her from behind. I hike through the forest where no one passes. Don't run, he says. My partner is a zoologist and he studies the winter moth uh, in Victoria and he's been doing this for 40 years or more and it's the uh, Gary Oaks on Mount Tuam that he's been studying and I've been helping him with uh, collecting data for about the last 10 years. So this poem is called Flightless Two. Sated winter moths emerge and the females fan a potion, charm clouds of males to mate. They stagger up tree trunks, lay eggs and die. The males take wing and fly to the light. Damp, windswept nights in November, a woman sleeps under flailing trees and dreams emerald fields with her love. The tilt of the moon beyond her window forecasts rain. The eggs, snug in crevices, under lichen, wait to hatch in spring. The larvae could crawl and balloon, all mouth, insatiable as hungry ghosts. They disperse on silken strands, winds buoyant into the unknown. Landscape plays a big part in my poetry and as you can see from the poems that I've read so far and this one is set uh, in the area in Quebec. Uh, I grew up on a farm in rural Quebec and I wrote this not that long after my mother died and my niece actually made a collage with the poem and the buttons from my mother's button bag. So this is the poem, Buttoned Up. Imagine all the buttons sewn back on skirts and blouses, white shirts starched and pressed, cufflinks hooked into folded cuffs. Imagine all the quilts reformatted into our dresses, the floral prints gathered, tucked and hemmed, all of us sitting in neat rows in church. Our patent leather shoes gleam, pressed ribbons dangle down our backs, from small hats perched on combed hair, Sunday best. Our family fills the pews of the re-sanctified country church where stained glass filters solemn light 
and the pump organ bellows a familiar hymn. We mouth the words. Imagine the thread spun back on spools and lined up in the sewing machine drawer, the button bag empty except for those extras that come with a coat or shirt in case of loss. All the buttons in place, holding everything together just as it should be, good, proper, neat and tidy, buttoned up like our lips.